Intuitionistic logic is great, but what does it mean? What are the semantics? That's a good question that puzzled an awful lot of logicians. Let's have a look what they found out. Hello everyone, welcome to Attic Philosophy. Today we're going to be talking about semantics for intuitionistic logic. So if you haven't watched the videos on intuitionistic logic yet, go and have a look at those or this one won't make much sense. So we're talking about semantics for a logic, but there's not just one way to do semantics for intuitionistic logic. There's several different ways. In this video, I'm talking about one way. It's the way that makes the best sense to me. Not everyone's going to agree that it's the best way, but we're going to be looking at Kripke models for intuitionistic logic. So this video is part of a series introducing the basic concepts of logic. If you are enjoying those, hit subscribe, hit the bell icon to get updates. This is a topic that historically in the history of logic, it's quite a big deal because intuitionistic logic was around for a very long time from pretty early on in the 20th century in the kind of first couple of decades it was being talked about. But for a long time, there was no semantics for it, at least not in the kind of sense of semantics that we've been looking at for propositional and classical first order and modal logic. It wasn't really until the end of the 50s, the 60s, that the kind of semantics that we're going to look at today came along. So that was kind of a big deal. OK, so the semantics for intuitionistic logic is not particularly straightforward. It's nowhere near as simple as the truth table semantics for classical propositional logic. We're going to be building models, but they've got a little bit more in them, even than the models that we've looked at for first order logic. So we're going to build up to the idea. So let's imagine that we're all together part of a big investigation. At the start of it, there's not a lot we know, but as the investigation goes on, we're going to find out more and more and more. When we discover something, we don't forget it, so we're going to be learning more over time, but we never lose track of the things that we've discovered. And there are different ways this investigation could go. It could go one way or another way. And if it goes one way, we might learn something. And if it goes a different way, we might learn something different. So putting that kind of idea together, we might be able to get a structure like this. Here's where we start off in our starting state S0, and we don't know a lot there. The investigation might go this way, and then it might end up here. Or it might go this way, and there's another branch point, so it might go from there to there or to there. And in each different path of this investigation, there's different things we might learn. So we can add to this diagram the things that we're going to learn along the way. So it might be that if we go this way, we find out Q. And if we go this way, we find out P. And then if we go here, we don't find out anything extra. But if we go from here to here, we find out Q. Going this way, we find Q. And let's suppose going there, we find P as well. So taking the whole investigation that way, we discover P or Q. Same if we go that way, but if we end up here, we only discover P. OK, suppose that's the whole of our investigation. We're going to use little models like that to get to grips with intuitionistic logic. And that's the kind of interpretation that we're going to put on these models. We're going to think about sentences not in a static way, but in this kind of dynamic developing way. So we're going to start off not knowing much. But just because we don't know something doesn't mean it's false, OK? Just because down here we don't know P, we don't know Q, it doesn't mean P and Q are false. It doesn't mean that we can assert not P or not Q because we might go on to learn P. We might go on to learn Q, OK? So we start off in a state of incomplete information. It's not that P's true. It's not that P's false. We just don't know yet. As we go on, we might learn new things or those things might end up forever unknown. Then we're going to build up from what we know at a particular state into more complex bits of information. So, for example, here we discovered P and we discovered Q. So we're going to count that as discovering P and Q. 
Similarly, here we got P, we got Q, so we got P and Q. Here we only got P, so we can't say P and Q, but we can say P or Q. Same with here, same with here. So conjunction and disjunction at a particular stage of this investigation, they behave in a very classical way. If you've got both P, Q, then you've got P and Q. And if you've got one of them, you've got P or Q. What about the other connectives, the arrow and negation? So these are going to be trickier. Let's look at the arrow first. If A then B, that's basically going to mean if at some point you discover A, you're thereby going to discover B. OK, so whenever you get A, you also get a B. Putting that in slightly more precise terms, imagine you're in a particular state of that investigation. Then looking forward, looking to all the states that you might end up in, you never see an A without a B. That's what it takes for if A then B to be verified in your current state. It means going forward, including the current one, you never get an A without a B. Wherever you find an A, you also find a B. OK, so going back to our diagram, let's see which conditionals are verified where. So if we look at this state here and we look at which states could we get to going forward, we're thinking about these two. And we say, is it the case whenever we've got P, we've got Q? Yeah, because there's P and Q and there's just Q. So at this state, if P then Q is verified. But if we look at this state, that's not true because here's a state we can get to from here. There's a P there, but there's not a Q there. So at this state, if P then Q isn't verified. What about going up this side? Well, let's look here. Everywhere we can get to from here, that is these three, wherever there is a Q, there is a P, because either we get both of them or we get P but not Q. Uh, so that means that if Q then P is verified. So going up this side, we get if P then Q. And going up this side, we get if Q then P. But at this state, we don't get either of them. OK, so working out if A then B can get tricky on these models, what you've got to remember is you're looking at all states you can get to in the future, plus the one you're currently at. And you've got to check all of them to see if there's an A there, is there also a B there? If that's true for all of them, then at the state you're interested in, the current state, if A then B is verified. However, if there's any state that you can get to in the future that's got an A but not a B, then if A then B isn't verified in your current state. What about negation, not A? One thing we could do is define not A as A arrow falsum. That's what we did in the video on natural deduction. So if we do that, then we need to know when falsum is going to be verified in these models. Simple answer, never. There's no state where falsum is verified because falsum basically means the thing that it is impossible to prove, the thing that it is impossible to verify. So you never have this. So not A is going to mean everywhere that A is verified, this impossible thing is also verified. But that's nowhere. In other words, not A means A is never verified. At all the states that you can get to in the future, plus the current state, you don't find A there. So not A is a little bit simpler than if A then B. Not A being verified at the current state just means you never get an A as you go further on in, in the investigation. It's not at the current state and it's not at any future state either. How does that look like in our little diagram? Well, at this state here, there's a P, but there's no Q and there's no future states. So not Q is verified at that state. But then at this state, Q isn't verified there, but not Q isn't verified either because there are future states we can get to where Q is verified. This is basically how these models account for intuitionistic logic and its rejection of excluded middle. So we just saw that down here we don't have Q, but we also don't have not Q. So here's a state that doesn't verify Q or not Q. Q is not there because we didn't write it there, but not Q isn't there because there is a future state where Q is verified. Similarly, P or not P isn't verified there because there's no P there, but there's also no not P because there's a future state where P is verified. So think about it like this. This future discovery of P knocks out not P down there. 
Not P requires all the future states to look a certain way. You're never going to discover P. So if we do, that blocks not P down here. That's how we get a failure of P or not P, the law of excluded middle down here. Basically, validity in these models means every state in every model verifies the sentence in question. So if there's some state in some model that doesn't verify a sentence like P or not P, it's not valid in intuitionistic logic. That's how these models get around the law of excluded middle. OK, so there we have a really brief introduction to intuitionistic semantics and how they work. In part two of this video, I'm going to go into more detail on precisely how we set up intuitionistic models, how we go over the semantic clauses for each connective. And just for fun, I'm going to show you how we can translate from intuitionistic logic into classical modal logic. That's a pretty good way a lot of people have discovered for helping to understand intuitionistic connectives kind of in terms that we're a bit more familiar with in terms of classical logic. OK, so if you are finding this stuff interesting, why don't you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to get updates, leave me a comment below. There is no such thing as a bad question on this channel. Thank you so much for watching this far. I will see you guys next time.